When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus, in this part of the Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, teaches us about the heart of the divine law. That the divine law is summed up in the great commandments, love God and love your neighbor. That what God commands us is summed up and it has its foundation in this great command of love. To love God with all our strength. That means to make great effort to love the Lord and to do His will. To love our neighbor as ourself. To see our neighbor as another self as another you. And Jesus teaches further on that the entire law of God, the Ten Commandments, the wisdom of the prophets, and we can also add here the teaching of the apostles and the saints and the church, rests on these two great commandments. The foundation of divine law is the great command of love, to love God and to love your neighbor. In one of the Psalms, King David speaks to the Lord in these words, I love you, O Lord, my strength. That's manifesting his living of that first part of the great command. In the Gospel of St. John, Jesus says, Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him. So here we now see that loving God is an intersection between our love for him and his love for us. And there are so many places in the sacred scripture that speaks about this reality of loving God and loving our neighbor. Now, this is a fundamental truth about our Catholic religion. This is right at the base, the foundation, the very sort of building block of our religion is, is this, the great command to love God with all our strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. But this is a fundamental truth that people can sometimes forget. You know, sometimes people can know a lot of things, but they can forget the very basic things they need to know. What happens when someone forgets this fundamental truth that our religion is really ultimately about this love? Well, when they forget it, then the Catholic religion for them turns into an ideology. It turns into a philosophy or a political position. God becomes an idea, and that's it. But this teaching of Jesus shows us that our Catholic religion is none of that. Our Catholic, religion, our Catholic religion is a relationship of personal love. It's a relationship of giving yourself to God and to others, and of Christ giving Himself to us. This teaching of our Lord shows us that God is not an idea, but He's a person. Actually, He's a trinity of persons. One God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But, when people forget this, then they fall into a trap. They begin to think that the Catholic religion is simply a set of ideas made by man. And if they are a set of ideas, then they change from person to person, culture to culture, and they shift from time to time. And what happens further on when they live this reality, this actually misunderstanding of reality, is they will define themselves usually in three different ways. They'll say that they're either a conservative Catholic, a liberal Catholic, or a moderate Catholic. But there's a problem with that. Actually, there's a very big problem with that. Conservative, liberal, moderate, as things that define your religion in Christ, say nothing about your relationship to the Most Holy Trinity. It says nothing about holiness, about grace, about truth, about salvation, about living in communion with the Most Holy Trinity. It says nothing about the resurrection and eternal life. These labels relate you not to the mystery of God, but only to other people and their ideas. Liberal 
makes you want to live in a way pleasing to the liberal crowd. If conservative, you want to live in a way pleasing to the conservative crowd. And if moderate, you want to live in a way pleasing to those in the moderate crowd. But what's missing in all that? We don't want to live in a way pleasing to this group or to that group. We want to live in a way pleasing to our Heavenly Father. We want to follow the Holy Gospel of Christ with all of our strength. Even this can happen to a priest. If a priest says, oh, I'm a conservative priest or a moderate priest or a liberal priest, well, that says nothing about the priest's personal relationship to Christ. It only says something about his relationship to what other people think. And you know something? We need to think about what Christ thinks. We need to do His will and to divine ourselves based on the truth that we are His children. Well, this is a modern problem, and people can fall into this trap. And the way to avoid that is to remember these great commands. But then there's another problem that people fall into in relationship to these great commands of love. They'll say, well, since Jesus teaches clearly that our religion is all about love, loving God and loving neighbor, then we don't really need the other commandments. We don't need the teaching of the apostles and the magisterium of the church. We just have to be loving. But think of this analogy. Think of a tree, a big tree. A tree has a trunk, and that's the biggest part of the tree. And then it has all these branches. And if it's a big tree, those branches can be quite heavy. Well, Jesus says that all of the Law and Prophets rests on the great commandments of love God and love neighbor. Think of the great commands as the trunk of the tree. And the branches are like the other commandments and the teachings in the Gospel and the Apostles and Magisterium of the Church. Well, people will say, as long as I have the two great commandments, if I'm just loving to God and loving to neighbor, I don't need to listen to the other commandments. Actually, I can break them and I'll be okay as long as I'm loving. People will say, and they'll actually do this, they'll allow all kinds of evils in their own life, and they'll say, well, this is okay because it's just all about love. Well, think about this for a moment. Are we loving God if we put things above Him? Are we loving God if we never pray, if we get involved in the occult, if we consult mediums and psychics and all those kinds of people? You know what the problem with those things are, by the way? It's manifesting that we're not trusting in our Father. God has our life in His hands. And when we go to these occult things, it's like we're saying, yes, God, I know that, but I need something else. That's why it's such a terrible sin. Are we loving God when we use His name in vain, either casually or even worse as a swear word, which people do all the time? This is the second commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Do you love the Lord when you do that? Are we loving our neighbor when we don't respect them? You know where loving your neighbor begins? In your family, in your marriage and in your family. That's where it begins. Are you loving your neighbor when you don't respect your family members or your friends? Are you loving your neighbor when you kill them or when you commit adultery? Adultery is, above all, an injustice. That's what people don't think about. It's an injustice, first against your promises to God, against the spouse against whom you've committed adultery, and against your children if you have any. Are we loving others if we steal their property, or if we lie to them, if we're envious of them, or treat them as objects of pleasure? No, we're not. So you see how the command, love of God and love of neighbor, really needs all those other commandments. Years ago, I used to work with a tree surgeon, a good friend of mine, and we used to cut down trees that were in danger of falling. And, you know, you have to do that because sometimes a tree can get a disease, it can start to rot, and no one sees the rot on the inside of the tree, but eventually it falls on someone and it, it's, it can be deadly. And so we had to cut down these trees and we were doing it because we wanted to help people survive, basically. Well, if you have a huge tree, in order to cut down the whole tree, you can't just cut from the trunk. 
because it's too big to manage and the whole thing's going to fall and it's, you don't know how what's going to happen. Usually what you do is you get in the bucket truck, you get up to the top, and you start cutting off the big limbs because it makes the job easier to manage. It's more work but, and it takes more time, but it's the safest way to do it. And when you cut off the branches, you really you can't cut off one side at a time. You've got to methodically do it because if you cut off all the branches on one side, then all the weight is on the other side and the tree can break and it can be very dangerous. So to take down a big tree that's been there for hundreds of years, we would start cutting off limb by limb and eventually we'd be able to manage the whole thing and then haul it off in a truck. Well, think of that imagery that the trunk of the tree is the Great Commandments. What are those Great Commandments? They are our relationship to God and to others. And those branches are the other Ten Commandments and the teachings of Christ in the Holy Gospel, the teachings of the Magisterium of the Catholic Church, which is found in the Catechism. Well, if you want to destroy the tree, you start cutting limb by limb, one limb at a time. Maybe it's the commandment to you not use God's name in vain. Well, you take that big branch off and maybe the tree's going to break. Maybe it's adultery. Well, you take that branch off of that commandment and then down the tree will go. It's actually something that will lead to the collapse of your relationship to God in this life and if you're not careful, in the life to come. So this imagery of the tree, I think, helps us to understand how all of the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and the teachings of Christ rest on these great commandments. They're connected and they have to stay connected. And when they're connected, then they're beautiful. So we have to make sure that love means that we follow God's will. We say that in the Our Father, Thy will be done. Now the challenge of the Great Commandments is that we have to really see that our relationship to God and to others is one of love. Love has a beginning, and if it's real, it has no end. And if it's real, it grows, and it grows, and it grows. Yes, love goes through trials and temptations, but if it's real, it's stronger. And if you're faithful to it, and you treasure it, it grows and grows and grows, and it keeps, it keeps the beauty of life there. Our love for God and our love for each other begins and it should grow. Well, how can we love God more? We have to. You know, if you think about it, as we go through life, we're either loving God more or loving Him less. You know, our, life, our lives are always moving in one direction or the other. We want to make sure we're loving God more. We can do this by praying more, by trusting in Him more, by simply making an act of trust. We can say what we say in the Divine Mercy Devotion, Jesus, I trust in You. By listening to His voice in silence, by reading the Gospel, by going to daily Mass if you can, Eucharistic adoration, by honestly acknowledging our own sinfulness and going to confession. It's essential. This is what loving God is. We have to do these things. And how can we love our neighbor more? Well, we could be more patient with them. You know, you think of Christ, He's patient with us. If Christ is patient with us, we should be patient with others. By forgiving others. Forgiveness is part of love. Now remember, where do these things begin to be practiced? In the family. By giving more of our time, our talent, and our treasure in service to others and helping them on the way and teaching people, for example, about Christ and His love. In the Bible we learn from St. John that God is love and we really need to have His love in our life. Without God's love in our hearts, then we really don't have real love in our lives. St. John Paul the Great once said in an encyclical letter he wrote years ago that we need love in our life, that if we don't have love in our life, then we don't understand our own lives, that our lives become incomprehensible. Well, God is love. He's that perfect love. 
and we have to live in communion with Him, beginning with our baptism onward. We have to have this personal relationship of love with the Lord. In this way, His love can shine forth through us to others. Dear brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, God shows us the depth of His love for us and for all people. He shows us that on the cross. He shows us that true love is sacrifice. But it's a sacrifice of power. It's a sacrifice that's beautiful. It's a sacrifice that really changes people heart, people's hearts and can save souls. If God shows us that He loves us so much, we have to accept this love, love Him in return, and make constant effort to grow in our love for Him and our love for one another. God bless you.